Mark, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Mark Dewidziak, and it strikes me as I'm probably the only person on this panel who actually needs an introduction this evening. So uh, by way of introduction, I'd like to think that I'm here because I'm a representative of all of you, is that uh, I was a 10-year-old horror fan in 1967 when I heard that uh, there was a vampire running loose in daytime television. So I had to check it out and I did and I was immediately hooked. So as I say, I'm here as, to a certain extent as a, as a fan, as somebody who loved Dark Shadows and loved what Jonathan Frid did on Dark Shadows. But I guess I'm also here because that 10 year old grew up to be a writer and a writer who spent 43 years as a television critic and a television critic who um, never lost his great love and admiration for Dark Shadows. Uh, so it is a great honor and a privilege to be here to help launch uh, this documentary, Dark Shadows and Beyond, the Jonathan Frid story. It is a great honor to be here because um, I got to see the documentary before all of you. And now I can put my TV critics hat on for a second and just say how strongly I need to recommend this to all of you. It is a wonderful, warm, glowing tribute to Jonathan Frid. But most importantly, it is a portrait of an actor. And I think sometimes, especially with people who do horror, we can sometimes can confuse the actor. And we think that they are great because they did horror roles. And what's really true is the horror role was great because they were great actors to begin with. And that is something which comes through in this documentary. But you're not here to listen to me. I'm the last person who needs to be talking. And so I am here to set this up. And one of the first things we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a little bit of a taste of this wonderful documentary. So here is a clip from Dark Shadows and Beyond the Jonathan Fritz story. Some viewers cried and others rushed to call ABC TV. Jonathan was spending his four week hiatus playing the role of Tony Wendis in the crime mystery play Dial M for Murder. The production ran for two weeks to sold out crowds at the Little Theater on the Square in Sullivan, Illinois. He came back and he did say to me, well, uh, thank you for carrying the load here while I was gone. <laughs> but uh, of course I was, I was delighted you know, to be able to to do that. Okay, uh, there's a, there's gives you a little bit of a, of a feel for a little bit of the dark shadows element of this. Um, I was 11 years old at the moment that Charity staked uh, what we thought was Barnabas Collins. It had me on the edge of my seat and uh, I literally fell off my chair at the moment that the, the staking happened. I can remember that so distinctly. As I said before, uh, the, everybody else who's on the panel needs no introduction. And I think that's uh, so much so true of our first guest. Uh, Laura Parker is not only a wonderful actress, but a wonderful writer and has carried on the Dark Shadows tradition in her Dark Shadows novels. And uh, Laura, of course, worked with Jonathan very closely because their storylines crossed so often. 
And Laura, I'd, I'd like you to talk about anything you, you, you really want to talk about, but I'll start with a specific question, which is this documentary is so much the portrait of an actor and it's really so much more about Jonathan Frid than it would ever be about Barnabas Collins. For anybody who only knows Jonathan as Barnabas, what do you think the one thing about Jonathan would surprise them if they, that they knew what he was really like? Couldn't remember his lines. <laughs> he, he had a tremendous he had a uh, very difficult time with lines yeah. and we had a uh, what's called a teleprompter which was the lines typed out on a piece of paper right next to the lens of the camera and you could see him when his eyes would go over you'd see him reading it and then he'd say it but that was the least that was a small problem he was marvelous. He was, the part was memorable because he did it. And Johnny Carl, Carlin always used to say, we're all here. This show happened because of this guy right here. And he'd point to Jonathan and say, he created the center of something that became so beloved all over the world, the country and the world. So. What, was jo what was Jonathan like? Just in, 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 to work with in rehearsal and in the process of doing dress rehearsals, and like you, 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 you were all in. I imagine that kind of experience is almost like being in boot camp together. You go through something which is an incredibly bonding all, experience. All, all, a lot of effort was a lot of effort was put into remembering where to stand, where the light was when to move, of course, through all your different transitions and responses, and you, you, know, you were aware of where the camera was, which camera was on you sometimes. It was, it was really stressful in a lot of ways, but he was constantly charming, warm, easy to be around. I, I, I didn't see him get upset very many times, and it was usually over his own performance. And he was the whole reason I got the part of Angelique because I auditioned with him and he, the, the scene was Angelique as a servant maid begging him not to leave her, that she loved him so deeply and he's gonna go off and marry her mistress, clinging to his shirt, please, please, please don't leave me, I love you so. And he leaned over and said in my ear, you know, she's a witch. I didn't know. I didn't know I was auditioning for a witch. I thought I was auditioning for an ingenue. And I turned to the camera and just gave it that look of hell up, no fury, like a woman scorned. If he hadn't said that to me, I wouldn't have done that. And that's the reason I was cast, I'm quite sure. And he, you know, we didn't realize that he had, he had an MFA in directing from Yale from Yale Drama School. Most of us didn't realize that he was even Canadian or that he had gone to the, uh, what is it, the college in London. The, mm -hmm. I That's right, the Royal Ca the Academy, yeah. Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, right. You know, he was just another actor up there trying to make it all work every day. And it was only later that I mean, one of the wonderful things about this documentary is you get to see him performing in plays, I guess in London or at, at school and doing Shakespeare. And to realize that he did have all of this background before he came, that he didn't just, he wasn't just a babe in arms. And he, he made the choice to create a monster who was sympathetic, who was, vulnerable, who was agonized over the fact that he had this terrible obsession where he had to drink blood. And he brought to it uh, a magnetism, uh, uh, some kind of theatricality that was, I guess, the result of the fact that he had worked in these, all these other places. But he was smart enough to give the part that sense of misery over what he had become. 
And the interesting thing is that when he forgot his lines, he would, oh no, I was in the scene with him. He would free, free, panic because he had the panic behind his eyes. And you could see the, just the feeling of helplessness and a fear, I don't know, agony. And so then we would all think, oh boy, the show was terrible. Jonathan remembers lines, you know. But then we'd uh, watch it the following week and here's the vampire in agony. So, so possessed by a sense of helplessness and it worked perfectly for the scene and worked perfectly for the character. Yeah. And, and, and like you, you both had sort of the same uh, challenge in, in the sense that you, you're playing a witch, he's playing a vampire. Nobody thinks they're a monster. You can't play a monster. Well, he was the one who said, he actually talked <laughs> it's the other way around. I so wanted to play Angelique as vulnerable and be the ingenue and be the, you know, the pretty princess character <laughs> because I was stupid enough to feel that that was what I wanted to do. And he took, he took me aside one day and he said, stop crying, stop complaining. You have the plum roll. You are not the heroine. You are the heavy. And you have a meaty part you can sink your teeth in. So there'll be a thousand ingenues. There'll never be another villain like this one. And I was astonished. It had never even occurred to me. He said, she's jealous. And I said, well, I said, well, I don't really get jealous. And he said, dig deep, honey. It's there. It's there. You'll find it. <laughs> and it was marvelous. You know, he was in that way so marvelous to work with. He was a director. He was, a, he was an incredible actor. A lot of us, none of us thought we were very good because it was so hard to do. We were doing it essentially live after three rehearsals. I mean, that's a very difficult thing to do on an artistic level where you're actually working when you're doing the scene. You're working on all those inner things that you need to be working on because you have so many other things to think about. But he had a magnetism, uh, you know, Johnny Depp called him elegant and magical. And that's true, he had, an he had a kind of statue that made him strong, he said, very strong, but when he smiled, he would melt your heart. You know, he, he had the whole range to choose from. And he definitely took that show to, from where it was to where it ended up. I mean, his, that he, I, I, find, I feel that he was very responsible. Well, that's a beautiful place to, 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 to end that. Thank you, Laura. And uh, we'll now uh, move on to somebody else who doesn't need an introduction, David Selby, who obviously played Quentin in all his incarnations. And um, David sort of got the chance to uh, relieve Jonathan in some sense because he took over so much of the leading man uh, presence on the show when Jonathan desperately, desperately needed some break. So, um, David, welcome. And uh, your your uh, memories, you, of Jonathan. Your memories of Jonathan in this documentary just glow. And I, oh. I just, I, I assume you. It's just so much from the heart that you had no trouble summoning these uh, these wonderful memories of Jonathan. Uh. Not at all, Mark, my goodness gracious. Uh, you know, I think we got a long way from the get-go and I, I completely agree with Laura and probably everybody else that ever did the show. Um, you know, Dan, the, the show apparently to my, was in a bit of trouble. And uh, so he <laughs> reached down into his bag and pulled out a, uh, a vampire you know, and thinking that that would. And so they started to write this, as I remember, you'll have to correct me, what they started to write this, you know, vampire that was um, 
whatever, had some evil qualities or whatever. But along came Jonathan. And <laughs> Jonathan had this um, ability. He just connected with the fans. He connected with the people. That, and then they started watching the show more and more. More people turned in. More people tuned in. And so Dan, I think that Dan and the writers, producers at that point said, oh, my goodness, <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to keep this man. We've got to have this man on the show all the time. And um, so then it became, you know, John had a heavy, what, uh, had a heavy burden. I don't think, I, not a burden, but a responsibility. I mean, he was uh, the show in that regard. You know, the fans just, oh, wanted more and more and more, you know, they couldn't get enough. So, um, and the rest of us, uh, to a certain extent, at the beginning, we were along for the ride. <laughs> And just glad it was all, you know, happening. But yeah, Dan got lightning struck when Barnabas took off as a character, but yeah. lightning struck again when Quentin took off as a character. And another actor uh, might have resented that or might have thought, uh, no, this is my show. Uh, oh. This is my. And Jonathan wasn't like that at all. Oh, if you no. may point out in the documentary, he 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 welcomed you. No, not at all. He was uh, uh, not just gracious, but he was glad. He said he was he was happy. And you know, from the right from the beginning, maybe my first day or second day when we realized what was going on. I mean, we would stop by each other's dressing room. You know. Just a chat. Hello, how are you? There was never an instant, never an instant where he felt anything other, we felt anything other than friendship right through, well, till we were talking one day and he's up in his hometown <laughs> where he grew up, basically. And he's, you know, said, well, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere, not doing much of anything. I'm just here uh, on the Internet, on his, you know, on his with the fans or whatever, writing this thing. And that was the, the extent. But that was years. That was 50 years later, whatever. But he was just terrific and wonderful. And I was so intimidated at first because um, he had gone to Yale drama school and he had all of this. And there was another fellow on our show, Thayer David. All these people had these educations. I think Thayer went to, you got to correct me, Mark, if I'm wrong, or uh, went to Harvard. Um, and there was Grayson and Joan. I mean, there were so many. Um, but Jonathan was right there and, and we all got along just wonderfully well. You know, one thing that, that this documentary makes very, very clear was that Jonathan was of the theater. He wasn't oh, yes. just in the theater, he was of the theater. And that's very something much. which you kind of all shared, didn't you, on the show? Yes, yeah, yeah. well. We were all theater people. We were all theater people. We were all, but it wasn't so. Un, it wasn't so unusual in those days, especially uh, uh, the actors, young actors going to New York. You know, uh, the first thing you did, or you bought a uh, what was it called, a, a newspaper? It was backstage or something, and you would check for open calls. You know, where when you go and you'd line up outside the theater and wherever it was, it could be downtown in the East Village or West you know, looking for some kind of work. And um, it's just one thing led to another. And then we all, yes, I think that that's probably the case for nearly all of the actors on Dark Shadows. They came out of the theater. Well, there's, there's a moment in the documentary where uh, they're talking about Jonathan's the theatrical career and they talk about how being part of a theater company, you become part of a family. 
because yeah. you bond, you get to, you have to rely on each other, you have to trust each other, and there's this sort of thing that that grows when you're when you're doing this. Yeah. I get the sense that I think you know the fans like to think it, but I think they they understand. You all became something of a family. When you talk about Jonathan in this this, this documentary, it does sound like you're talking about a brother. Oh, I get. Uh... I get a little emotional, Mark. Sorry. Well, it's but, from the uh, heart, David. That's why. You know, it's genuine. It's from the heart. And I understand that, you know. But, uh, you're right. That, uh, we, did, we did become a family. Mm -hmm. You know, we would start there in the morning. And I heard Laura, I think, uh, mention, you know, we would read around the table a couple of times. We usually read the next day's script that night. And we go home, we'd learn the lines where you come in early in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning. And we would uh, block out, you know, the scenes or whatever. And then we would, we were together all day long, every day. Then we'd sit down, uh, you know, and read the next day's script. But it was very, very much a family. I mean, sometimes we'd go up and have a, I don't know, a, a Coke or a, a, some food together or whatever up at the corner. And ABC, as I was told, I, I, you may have actually built that studio for us. And we were, we were in that down there on 53rd Street. And, uh, and anyway, it was uh, quite a family. It really was. Uh, I can't, I don't ever remember any <laughs> kind of, maybe there was, do you know, any kind of argument or friction or whatever. Um, it was quite special. And, and our good. leader was, you know, he was there. And all you had to do, Mark, was I mean, it was incredible, his following. I mean, it was like, I, I don't know. It, uh, it, it was something very special to see the, 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 the fans surround him and uh, the gifts he would get at the studio or whatever, you know, it was, it was quite special. The way but it, never, you know, Look, anyway, the, the wonderful thing about being an actor is that 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 gift goes on and that that connection is not not severed uh, because the performance is always there and the yeah. connection is always there. Th thank you, David. That was, oh, no, that was thank real, you. as wonderful. That's special. OK, yes. uh, James Storm, James Storm, uh, best known for playing Gerard on the show. And James uh, came into the, the run of the show a little bit later. Uh, but uh, he got, he's got some very special moments in this documentary as well. James, I'd like to ask you, um, you got to see the documentary. Mm -hmm. Was there something about the, the, the documentary that you were surprised to learn about Jonathan? Um, no, I think the documentary captured it beautifully. Um, I, uh, and before we really get started, Mark, I want to say thank you so much for your hosting this this is a wonderful presentation i really appreciate it oh. and uh and the people who are watching fans and all of that i think it's a, a really important that people understand who who jonathan was and the way that you handled and the questions and everything i, I could very commendable so i thank you and i thank the fans and i also thank the this lovely lady next to me. <laughs> Hi, Valerie. <laughs> and and, and uh, who is my loving wife. So anyway, thank you. Uh, but uh, to get to, to answer your question, you know, I looked at it and I, it, it, it was a, a very powerful piece because um, I, I just kind of, um, you know, I was in the last year of the show and I didn't know Jonathan that well. But I, as I mentioned in the documentary, uh, you know, I was a young kid in, New, in San Diego, and I saw this performance of uh, Caliban 
at the Shakespeare Festival and I was uh, bowled over and I and I mentioned that in the documentary. But anyway, what I didn't say is that what what was it that made it so compelling? What made it so uh, uh, dynamic and 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 true? And I was driving the other day and I was thinking, well, what is the answer? And I and and Larry hit it right on the head. It's it, he was human. And I've seen a lot of productions of The Tempest. And I mean, everybody plays it as a monster. Everybody plays it as, you know, the, the forbidding or foreboding character. And nobody touches what this character has a heart and body and mind and soul. And, and Jonathan brought it out. And it was, uh, that's why it stayed in my mind uh, all these years. It was an extraordinary performance. His background in Shakespeare is so key to his success on Dark Shadows, I think, because he asked the actors questions when he has, you know, when he's, he's asked to play Barnabas. He, they're, all they're really saying is you're playing a vampire. Well, how do you play a vampire? No, no. You know, and you got to draw on something. And I remember him saying in an interview, it's interesting you went to Caliban because I remember him doing an interview when Dark Shadows was on and him saying that Caliban was one of the ways he saw in mm -hmm. uh, and when how to play Barnabas, which is odd because you don't think of the characters as being. At that's, all. Why, that's why Bonav Barnabas was so, uh, so successful is because he, uh, he, you know, he brought the human quality and the event of that quality to, to, uh, to the screen. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do remember, <laughs> I do remember the line situation and everything like that, but, I, I really loved watching him because he, as Tony Zerbe points out, that this guy was absolutely f fearless. Uh, you know, he would he would stand there and he would gain his thoughts. And if he, you know, he was playing a scene with a character, he'd stop and you know he was going up, and he'd just look at the prompter <laughs> and, then, and then and then continue on. But it was it was all a part of it was an extraordinary thing to watch, but. Uh, I, I saw there's a lot of humor to it, and but he was he was a gentleman. He was a class all into himself uh, of a performer and a gentleman of the theater, and that's an it's a real it's you know you don't see a lot of it certainly not in this business now, but they, he was thoughtful and compassionate and understanding, um, and one incident that that happened to me, which, which kind of exemplifies everything about what I feel about Jonathan, was I had just come off stage at one of the, the conferences, uh, the Dark Shadow conferences, and I had heard that Jonathan was coming, and it had been a long time, uh, and I hadn't seen him in 40 years. I mean, it was just forever. And I'm walking backstage, and here comes Jonathan with this little entourage, and he looks at me, he says, oh, Jimmy Storm, Jimmy Storm. 49th in Lexington, when Jonathan was first born and you were standing there in, with a stroller and you and your wife were talking and we sat there and we talked about your work on the doctors and the years that it, I was just blown away that he could first, you know, just remember everything. He, it was extraordinary. And it was a, just one of the most you know, memorable moments I can think of when it comes to Jonathan Fritt. He's just a, a just a class act all the way. You know, you know I, I, I'm working on a biography of Edgar Allan Poe at the present. And mm -hmm. one of the things I'm trying to knock down is this idea that people have this idea of Poe as being, you know, somewhat mad and being somewhat, it, behind all of that was a very caring, courtly, gentlemanly, professional, and well, he, was it Jonathan? Wasn't he working on a one man show of Poe? He, he did so. He did the, the Telltale Heart and he did uh, the Cask of Amontillado. In the, but his, he didn't do the, the, the life of Poe, did he? he no, just, I don't believe so. But yeah, I thought that's but, what he was working on. Yeah. But you know, it's so often with people who are associated with horror roles, people think you have to be a little bit to get that. And it's the opposite. You have to be in complete command of your craft Absolutely. in order to play that. Absolutely. You know, and that's what comes through. Thank you, Jim. That was wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. that. Marie Wallace. Um, Marie, uh, who started off playing Eve and then the Mad Jenny on Dark Shadows. 
but got to know Jonathan really, really well after Dark Shadows. And they shared a, a lot of passions, which included the theater, of course. And Jonathan ends up directing Marie, which she tells in the documentary, but also a love of cooking. So Marie, welcome. Uh, what you. did you think of the documentary? Oh, I love the documentary. It showed so many parts of Jonathan that we all knew and many parts that we didn't even know. I love seeing him in his acting roles when he was a kid in his hometown. It, it was just perfect, perfect. And yeah, it's true. I didn't really get to know any of the actors during my time on Dark Shadows because I was in and out with my characters, you know, but it was when we started to do the um, conventions that I got to know everybody. And of course, Jonathan started doing his one man shows. And he even asked me to do Lady Macbeth and he did Macbeth and it was wonderful. And we would get together in his room. And as Jim said, he's such a gentleman, so fine. And my experience with him in the Lion in Winter was just phenomenal because everyone has heard that Jonathan went to Yale and got his degree, his master's in directing. And he always used to say, but I haven't ever directed anything. Well, finally, in the 90s, he was asked by the um, head of the drama department, uh, David Moore, to do, to direct The Lion in Winter. And he said, yes, I want to do it, but I would like to have Marie Wallace do Eleanor of Aquitaine. And he called me and I said, oh, God, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. And because it's a wonderful part and it was such an experience to see and be with Jonathan from the other end, you know, he directing me and this entire class of um, students and he was a wonderful director he could have been he would have worked loads of times especially in anything as fine and dramatic as this play or Shakespeare or anything else and of course he <laughs> acted so much he got so many parts as an actor that he never had the chance to direct but it was most wonderful to spend all that time and that's when we got to really know each other and then find out all the little things like his love of cooking and we cooked together and he loved the concerts and I would invite him to the Philharmonic concerts. We'd have a cocktail party in my house and then walk right over to Central Park and he would come with a little folding chair that had legs about this high, you know, and put it down and he'd bring Louis Edmonds. And so we got to know each other that way. And it, it was so, Wonderful. So I, I love the fans to know, and I wish that so many of them had been able to see that production. But many did come because there were announcements that Dark Shadows, Jonathan Frid was directing this play. And so we would have um, talks after the show. And that was really fun. And, and to see the Dark Shadows fans and come from quite a distance to the theater for the one evening show and then go home. You know, you're in position to answer a question which maybe nobody else is. So I'll, I'll ask you, you know, Mary might know, but yeah. because the, the beverage that is most associated with Jonathan because of Barnabas is uh, type A or type B negative. Uh, what was Jonathan's favorite drink? You know, Mary will know that because I, I don't know drinks, names and stuff. I just mm -hmm. drink wine, so I don't know. But I know he liked, he liked something very mm -hmm. much. Okay, <laughs> well, we'll have Mary feel that yes. question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jonathan, as we were saying before, this keeps coming up, the, the, the word theater with, you know, big capital T keeps coming up. And after Dark Shadows, it seems like the great gifts were all theater gifts, being able to do the one-man show, being able to direct, being able to do Arsenic and Old Lace. Um, it all seems to go back to the theater uh, for, for Jonathan. And that- you, It's you, wonderful. It, I was so happy that he could do those parts. Arsenic and Old Lace, I went to see, and it was wonderful. My friend Larry Storch was in that too. Mm -hmm. And just to see them 
you know, on stage like that, it was, it was wonderful. He was, well, it, go ahead. I'm sorry, Marie. Go no, ahead. I was just going to say, Jonathan was a very unique person. I mean, he, the voice, that's the one thing when I walked into the studio that day and he started to speak, the voice was so magnificent, I felt. And these high cheekbones, I'd never seen any like that. It was very unusual looking and it just worked so beautifully. And he was so kind of simple in many ways, you know? I mean, simple in, 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 in simplicity that, uh, you know, he liked very simple things, even just a dinner or he'd give a party and I'd be his hostess. And it was just always elegant. That's the thing that I always think of Jonathan, elegance, an elegant gentleman. Uh, I, I wish we had hours to talk. This has really been so wonderful. Thank you, Marie. Oh, for, thank you. That. Thank you, Mark, for being here and, and seeing all of us and oh, able to talk about this wonderful documentary. It's wonderful seeing you again. So uh, we'll talk again. Okay. And now, Mary O'Leary. Mary was is the person behind the documentary. She is the producer, director. She was Jonathan's friend. She was his, his business partner. So Mary, you knew him. Um, this has the, the labor of love cannot even begin to say what this is for you. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, yes, I really refer to this as my passion project, um, devoted two years, uh, kept me very busy during COVID, um, worked with my marvelous editor, uh, Michael Giglio, who is in Woodbridge, New Jersey. Um, we would uh, every day have edit sessions. Uh, and the wonderful thing is that he was not familiar with Dark Shadows or Jonathan Frid. So as we continued uh, each day, he could be that objective eye when I was often too close to it. So that really helped me as I had to make decisions of what to cut, because it was probably an hour too long <laughs> when we did the first cut. Um, it, it was, I just had a great time. I mean, traveling up to Canada where, when Jonathan had retired up there in 1994, I went to visit him several times and met family members, but it would be very brief, like over a dinner party. And now I was actually going up and sitting and talking and hearing the stories um, that they remember during John's final years up there um, and with, with family. Um, and um, I you know, learned some things that I didn't know, but reinforced what I did know about him. And, I'm, uh, and I enjoyed, uh, of course, I was also in New York interviewing people uh, in Los Angeles where I am. And then also made a trip to Memphis uh, to meet this really entertaining actor named Barry Fuller, 90 years old, who, who had terrific memory about his work with Jonathan in regional theater. Um, and again, Anthony Zerby, who worked at two regional theaters with Jonathan, had tremendous stories. Um, and then people that went to Yale with him. I was able to locate um, Bob Calfin, who was the founder of the Chelsea Theater in New York and was the artistic director for 30 years, had terrific stories about Jonathan and also Dick Cavett, who of course I knew Dick Cavett had had Jonathan on his talk show, TV talk show, but I didn't know that they had been um, in a production at the American Shakespeare Festival together. With so, Catherine Hepper. Yes, with Catherine Hepper <laughs> and Larry. Somebody Gates. else was in that show too. <laughs> yeah, there was, yes, yes. Um, that whole season, um, he worked with incredible actors, Alfred Drake on down the line. And uh, then for a year went on tour with Catherine Hepburn in Much Ado About Nothing uh, to all the major cities. Uh, as a matter of fact, years later when he was in Arsenic and Olace and he went to Detroit, he mentioned in an interview that, that was his first time back in Detroit yeah, since when he was there with Kate Hepburn in 1958. <laughs> you get this question probably more than everybody else on the panel because you knew him so well and you worked so closely with him. But you also were doing the work of doing the interviewing and gathering the information. So did you learn something about Jonathan that surprised you? I would say when I was in Canada, I learned a lot more about his family than I had known. He had spoke very, very highly of his father in terms of his father being a man of integrity and how he ran his business and how fair he was with his employees. Um, and I knew that his mother was very supportive 
uh, in terms of having parties and events for clients of her husband's to, to get to again get more and more business for her husband's company. But I didn't realize how supportive they were of his career as an actor, which he really at the age of 17 started performing in plays. And there was a theater just down the street from their home on Queen Street in Hamilton that was a little theater that already had an incredible history of existing a hundred years. And he began to do productions there. Well, come to find out, both his parents, not only were they supportive, but they became involved. The mother was on the advisory committee to help choose plays. Uh, the dad, they were donated an old house because they went to different spaces and they were then donated a house, it was a 150 year old house. And um, it of course was, they needed to renovate it. And Fred Construction came in and built a stage in the house. Uh, in the 50s. So it, it's really amazing how much his parents were involved in supporting his career in the theater and the arts in general. Um, so I would say that's probably in talking to, I, I ended up here talking to his niece and she told some lovely stories. Um, one was that she remembered when she was in high school and became interested in acting and school plays. When Uncle John came to visit, um, she would ask him to come and read Shakespeare and they'd go into one of the rooms where it was quiet and he would read Shakespeare speeches for her. And she always was so thrilled to have those sort of private moments. And so there were just some charming stories. People didn't necessarily want to go on camera, but they shared some really charming, intimate stories that, again, just reinforced what I did know about Jonathan. You know, I think one of the things that you use in the, the documentary, which is just absolutely charming, but also helps bring Jonathan to life, is the letters that he sent home to his parents, mm -hmm. and uh, which are, you know, read, obviously. And, uh, but the, these charming, wonderful letters of what it's like to be an actor uh, mm -hmm. away from home. And telling your parents, oh, uh, I may get this role and I may, that, that's a very illuminating part because you get to see Jonathan as a young actor and you get to hear it in his words. It was amazing find. I did know that Jonathan had kept letters when I was working with him. He put together scrapbooks that he could put on display when he went to the Dark Shadows festivals. And in them, he incorporated some pieces letters that he wrote at the beginning of his time at Dark Shadows. So I was familiar with those letters, but I was not aware of how far the letters went back. And so I'm very grateful that I was able to uh, locate the letters and then really read through them. And the first one was from 1959. And then it was through the 60s, as exactly what you're saying. He was pursuing his career in New York City and in regional theater. Uh, and God, they're so beautiful some of these letters and there's uh so emotion in them as he tells about his his highs and lows of being in the industry and i knew i needed to find a special voice to be jonathan's voice not to imitate him but a, a talented actor with a marvelous voice and was blessed to have ian buchanan agree to do this for me um he is from scotland originally jonathan's maternal uh, family was from Scotland. His grandmother, who he adored, was born there. And, and people have said, the name of your production company, Clunes Associates, where did Clunes come from? Well, Jonathan's grandmother was born in Scotland and the family home was called Clunes when she came to Canada, specifically Waterdown in Ontario. She wanted to keep her heritage with her. So they put a gate at the entrance and it said Clunes. And Jonathan, as a young boy with his brothers, would go every spend the entire summer with his grandparents and there he was walking through the clunes arch and so when he was working with me he said i want to call the company clunes associates which was fine with me but going back to um ian um ian who wasn't you know really familiar with jonathan um and i talked about him and then um uh, he really got interested in, in finding connections and jonathan for its mother flora had actually been a nurse during World War I. And um, Ian's mother was a nurse. Um, also that Ian was born in Hamilton, Scotland and Jonathan was Hamilton, Ontario. There were all those kind of coincidental things that, that Ian found very, very fascinating. 
and he just has a, a marvelous voice. And so it was just terrific to be able to have him be the voice of Jonathan in these letters. And this, as, I, as you said, it was just an amazing find because I, I was going to, it was really going to be tough as to how to capture that period of his life. There's plenty of interviews during Dark Shadows, during his one-man show years, but to go back and find how can I capture those early start of his career in theater and the letters did that for me. So it really was terrific to be able to have those. I, I you know, I truly wish we did have hours because this is flying by so fast. <laughs> but we, I also should stress that we did get questions uh, from the many submissions received from uh, from fans. Uh, so why don't we go to some of the questions and see yes. you know, how, how, how we can feel this. Um, this one is from uh, Debbie Beebe. And her question is, did Jonathan have any hobbies? Jonathan loved gardening. It actually started as a young boy. I think his mother, Flora, great name for someone who loves gardens, uh, had a garden um, at the family home in Hamilton, but also huge amounts of acreage at Waterdown that she would um, have uh, a lot of the people who work for Fritz Construction come over and help and plant all the, the, the different flowers. And uh, actually I've seen some quite beautiful pictures of the property. And um, it was interesting because there was a main house and then there were seven cottages because the McGregor um, family was, there were seven flora and uh, her brothers and sisters, they each had their own cottage. So in the summer they'd come with their kids and and spend the summers together. Um, but Jonathan's little boy in back of his house had a little garden. And um, so as years went on, I mean, in New York City, it's not easy to have a garden. Uh, oh. When he had, <laughs> when he had a, 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 his apartment uh, during Dark Shadows, he moved to a penthouse apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And he, on the, pen, on the penthouse patio, he created a beautiful garden and there are some pictures of that. And then, then when he retired back to Canada and bought a house for the first time at the age of 70, he decided to have this garden and it just was a beautiful, beautiful garden. And he also loved, and if anyone does travel to Hamilton, the Royal Botanical Gardens are must see. Jonathan would love strolling there. It's just acres and acres of beautiful flowers. There's even a rock garden. Uh, there's a lilac festival every year. Uh, so that really, I would say in terms of his hobby was his favorite. Then he also loved Richard III. And also when he retired to Canada, got very involved in the Richard III Society. And they would have monthly meetings in Toronto and he would go up and discuss, okay, was Richard III really as bad as Shakespeare paints him? And, um, and he would of course also read for them sometimes. So he, he enjoyed that as well. Very good. This one is from Tracy Thomas. Uh, did Jonathan ever visit Seaview Sea Terrace of obviously the model for Collinwood in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, which was used as the exterior of Collinwood in the series. Well, during the times the series was on, Jonathan had not been there. Dan Curtis had taken original cast members, Louis Edmonds, Alexander Mulkey, David Hennessy, to shoot exteriors, but Jonathan was not on the show at that point. It was really years later, um, in 1985, members of the Dark Shadows Festival Committee thought it would be fun to film Jonathan there. And so there is a video that exists of him walking around the property and looking up at it and saying, I think that's where uh, the tower where my mother you know, killed herself and uh, in 1795, or that's the door, that's a little that led to where Adam was hiding. So it's actually quite a fun video. But the other thing that happened was that when I began working with him and was trying to get the first engagement for his first one-man show, Jonathan Fritz, Fools and Fiends, his first booking was at Salvary Junior University and Seaview at that time was the boys dorm for this university. So Jonathan didn't perform in the house, he performed in their theater, but we did walk around and inside, at that point we did go inside and walk around, which was great fun. Um, so those were the times that Jonathan actually was at Seaview, which of course now is for sale for I think a mere thirty million dollars. So we're going to go in on that, right? We're just uh, we're going to put a down payment. <laughs> I would get a GoFundMe thing going here. Okay. All right, this one is from Andrew Kraft. Uh, it says, "Mr. Frid received an MFA in directing from Yale. Other than Lion and Winter with Marie, did he direct any other productions? And was there a sense that Mr. Frid was disappointed 
that more directing opportunities were not afforded him? That's a good question. When Jonathan came to New York after that program, well, actually right after Yale, he went on that tour that I mentioned with Kate Hepburn and then settled in New York City. His focus was acting. That was his passion. Uh, I think he got an agent and the agent began to send him out for work. Um, and that was coming his way and there really wasn't the opportunity to direct. Um, also, as he often said, is as an actor gets an agent, agent hears about auditions, you go to those auditions. Um, or when you first start out, as David mentioned, you see auditions in the backstage newspaper and you follow them. Um, Jonathan got an agent pretty early on, but directors, it's harder. It's like, who can connect you to theaters? Um, so he focused on the acting. Um, he did, there, during his one-man shows, he was his own director. He would actually record uh, his rehearsals in his apartment, and then he would look at them. And he was looking with the eye of how I'm directing himself, which is kind of interesting. So in a way, he did do some directing in addition to Lion and Winter. But the other thing I always remember Jonathan saying, in life, never have regrets. You made choices and you move on. Um, so I would say he didn't regret what happened. Um, he enjoyed the experiences that he did have. Okay. This one is from Fiona Do Drewitt or Drewitt. Did Jonathan ask the writers to create the character of Bromwell for him to portray in the last few months of the series? Did he not want to play Barnabas any longer? The character of Bramwell came about when Dan Curtis walked into the writer's room and said, this is the last chapter of Dark Shadows, make Jonathan be somebody else. And then the writers created Bramwell, which ended up being sort of this marvelous story with Laura Parker um, and that sort of uh, uh, love story again, getting told as they were different characters. Jonathan always said, his role was an actor. He would never try to write the show. His, that, the actor's job is to give the script that is given to him. Um, Jonathan loved the part of Barnabas. He thought it was a very multifaceted character and, and had a great time. He was frustrated that he could never quite get the lines down. Um, and he did joke about the fact that when he had to show his fangs, the directors encouraged him to exaggerate. And he always felt it was too over the top. But out of four years on the show, it was maybe four minutes. Um, but ultimately, he would have been happy to play Barnabas for the last three, four months of the show. But the, Dan had told the writers to create another character. So he, he played that. This one is from Christian Bartley. And I we kind of touched on this, but uh, it's, we'll make it a little more specific. What did Jonathan's parents think about his role on Dark Shadows? Um, sadly, Jonathan's father passed away before Dark Shadows. And Jonathan always felt, uh, I think, a little um, hole in his heart that his dad never saw him achieve the success that he did. Um, his father actually, the last few years of his life had had a stroke and it was quite debilitated. Um, his mother um, was thrilled that he had a, a job that was every week because normally he did a play and he might have a four week rehearsal period and then it might only run a month or two months. And so now he had a long-term job and so she was happy about that. Dark Shadows wasn't seen up in Canada. She couldn't watch it. And one time, which was in the letters actually, that Jonathan made arrangements. She said she was gonna go down to Buffalo and go out, get a hotel room so she could watch Dark Shadows in the hotel room in Buffalo. And it talks about that. Um, I, I think she was kind of puzzled by the plot lines of what was happening, but she was always very good about seeing him in plays and was thrilled to see him in this TV show. Um, one thing I remember he said that she was annoyed with was there had once come an article in a magazine, probably one of the daytime magazines entitled my son, the vampire, as if it was an interview with his mother, she had never been interviewed. And she's kind of annoyed that somebody would just assume, you know, what her opinion was and then write an entire article. But I believe there were several times or a story that was written an article, other people would copy and edit it down. So there was a lot of repeating of different things that in fact, Jonathan didn't give uh, you know, maybe that particular interview. And also I think one time there was an article about my friend, Jonathan, and 
the man James went to the studio on tour and John said, I don't know who they're talking about. This is all made up. <laughs> so, um, but there was a lot of press at the time, you know, a lot of press. I think we got time for one more uh, of the questions. And this one is from Jan Tobin. Uh, what was the reaction of Mr. Fritz family when they learned about your documentary project? I'd have to say across the board, everybody was very happy. They, were, they wanted to see their uncle John um, receive this honor. Um, they were, would, were very willing to tell me stories. Again, some of them didn't want to be on camera, but they shared a lot of uh, different stories. One of the things was his, his sister-in-law, um, his brother Doug's wife, uh, talked about you know getting a little nervous as you come into a family and, uh, uh, and how Jonathan, made you so comfortable. He was the easiest member of the family to be with. And she always was very grateful for him. Maybe the most important question of the evening, where can people see the documentary, Mary? And how <laughs> can they see it? Well, we've been promoting that the release date is Tuesday, October 5th, but actually I think the release will be an entire week because the original plan for MPI was to have it on Amazon. And for some reason they had, they had passed so they began to scramble to get uh, another service. Uh, They're still attempting to go back and plead their case with Amazon. But in the meantime, Apple TV is delighted to have it. Apple TV is still in the process of their final technical steps. So we're not sure if they're gonna make Tuesday. I don't have a link yet, but it is also on other platforms. And one uh, this evening, I will put the link for, which is vimeo.com. It will also be on Voodoo Fandango. Um, and it's also on a series of, of cable services um, for rental. For all of these that I list, um, basically it's purchase or rental. It's not just streaming, it's purchase or rental. And some are just rental. So just rental, Sling TV, AT&T, Direct TV, Dish, On Demand. So they've really pushed to get it a lot of places. And then even for international, Ubiquity um, is a distributor that puts programs globally and um, including nearby Mexico and Cuba. So it will be on that. So there's many different platforms. People stay tuned to the Facebook page, Jonathan Frid Doc. On that Facebook page, I will put daily updates this week as to the different links for all these different ones that I've mentioned and any new ones I don't know about. But obviously most important, I want to get you out of Apple TV. When I get that link, I will get it to you. So please, Keep looking at Jonathan Frid Doc Facebook and Instagram. Okay, um, why don't we show them another clip? So yes, please. To whet their appetite. Here we go. Here is our second clip from Mary's wonderful documentary. Jonathan, I, someone handed me the Grand Rapids Times. The headline is "TV Vampire Causes Grand Rapids Airport Riot." What? <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> I took a a 10 city tour in five days which was kind of rough going but the thing about it was that no one really expected a turnout that we would get in all these airports and, and uh, shopping centers and things like that so that there was there was no kind of organized uh, control of crowds we were late getting into uh, Grand Rapids and they had a crowd uh, where our plane landed and uh, it, the thing got so out of hand that we all got kind of nervous. There was so much uh, uncontrolled chaos, and uh, so we got this hearse. While I was getting on top of this hearse, I was rather, if you'll pardon the expression, mortified. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we were, we were sort of circling around in front of these thousands of, of teenagers and so forth, and a, a regular commercial airliner was unloading at that point, and I... Suddenly I was trying to think of their point of view. Here they were with these thousands of kids and this idiot on top of this hearse with fangs. And, fangs. <laughs> and uh, what was it going on? You know, what, what's happened to America? Well, there you have it. Uh, check it out. I can't recommend this enough. Mary, I know, Mar and, Mark? Mark, and Mark, I forgot to say it is available also on DVD and Blu-ray on Amazon Prime. You can go I, on I, and, I, and order it. For, for us old school people who like the, the, the hard copy of something, I, I was going to, to ask that before we left. I assume there's a way to own the actual physical copy yeah. of this. Yes, yes. Which, which and I understand the sales are going very well. So now if you order, it's going to take a few weeks to get that copy. If you order right away a month ago, you'll be, it'll be shipping out October 5th. 
Well, excellent. Well, thank you for letting me be here. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the, the opportunity to, to play host with this. I think everybody is, 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 is back for a second. So Ooh. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It was great. Yep. My, again, so my much. pleasure. Mark, when are you coming to L.A.? Well, who knows? Hopefully, I used to be able to answer that question when I worked had a, a day job for a newspaper. I could answer that question really easily. And it's like, I'm there every January and every summer. But well, since, uh, stop, would you? I mean, I, I don't know you and I've never met you and I enjoy.